We're now entering the fourth topic of this course, and it's a vast field. We're going to talk about perception. Now, this term can be understood in many different ways. And it is absolutely central to the concerns of cognitive science because, in some respects, perception describes the means by which we come to know the world around us, mediated by our senses. So let's talk about those senses first. Now, there's a popular view, not entirely wrong, that we own five senses and that these five senses are the means by which we come to know the world. Those are traditionally described as touch, hearing, smell, taste and sight. And as familiar as this framework is, um, we are going to have to disturb this and query it somewhat. The terms sense and sensation can be used in several different senses, and these have not acquired stabilized meanings in spite of several hundred years of work in the area. We noted that the um, there's been a long-running Contrast between approaches to mind which focus on reason or the intellect, and those are rationalist approaches, and empiricist, empirical concerns, which are more concerned with how we come to know the world through engaging with it, through being plugged in. And so these are this is the basis for our empirical knowledge of the world that we're talking about. And the simplistic language that we have acquired which, which details five separate sensory modalities, turns out not to be terribly reliable. So let's consider what we mean by a sense. Now, when I say a sense, that already presupposes that we have multiple senses, that they are somehow separate, and that they inform us about different aspects of the world. That's not entirely wrong. But it, the situation turns out to be much more complicated than that. One question we might have is, what do we mean when we say it informs us about the state of the world? Um, if we take a neurocentric view of human cognition, in which the nervous system is seen as the basis for all cognition, then we would have to look at the points at which the nervous system makes contact with anything else. There, we can identify receptors. Receptors are dedicated areas of the body in which um, physical change is transduced into neural activity. So we can go looking for those receptors. And what we find is not five kinds. So we've got a host of different ways in which we are affected by things going on around us. Audition or hearing it corresponds more or less to our uh, portrayal of a sensory modality in that what goes on in the ear informs us about the world. And we find receptors there in which physical vibration in the air is converted into activity in a nerve. Vision uses a different specialized organ, the eye. And it is at the retina of the eye, at the back of the eye, that goings on in the world changes in the distribution of light with respect to the head are somehow converted or transduced into nervous system activity. What we'll see though is that seeing is not all about that. Um, we also have uh, important information coming from a different part of, get this, the ear, which is relevant to seeing. This is the vestibular system that provides a sense of balance and contains three semicircular canals filled with fluid which record accelerations of the head. These work together with the eyes and contribute to seeing. An awful lot contributes to seeing, far more than the eyes. 
So with that, the situation becomes more complicated. Taste and smell were picked out as two separate sensory modalities, but you might question that if you've ever had a cold. As you know, when you lose your sense of smell, your taste is hugely affected. Taste and smell are never independent of each other, even though we have receptors at different sites of the body. So there, the idea of five distinct sensory modalities is coming under threat. But the situation gets vastly more complex when we look at other forms of receptors in the body. When it comes to touch, which in the folk vocabulary is a single sensory modality, we find receptors in the skin, which is the organ we need to consider here, which are sensitive to very different kinds of information. We have thermoceptors, which are sensitive to hot and cold. We have sensors which are sensitive to vibration, sensors which record only the presence of damaging stuff, pain. We have sensors which are uh, receptors which are sensitive to light touch. So we encounter many different kinds of world-based information through the skin. And so touch unfolds then as not one, but many kinds of sensory modalities. So our number five is really getting wobbly here. But then we have a whole bunch of other receptors, that is points at which goings on external to the nervous system become converted to activity or influence activity in the nervous system. We find receptors in the joints and in the muscles that inform us about the position and movements of our bodies. This, these go by the terms proprioception and kinesthesia. Proprioception refers to your awareness of the position of the body and kinesthesia to your sense of movement through space. These are not included in the traditional five senses, and yet they provide extremely important information in coping with the world. There's much less work done on these, and it's not clear that these can be accommodated within a sensory modality framework. But then it gets weirder still because we have lots of other receptors in, the, in our bodies in which the nervous system is affected by things external to the nervous system, specifically by the condition of the body. So we know when we need to um, go for a pee. We know when we're hungry. We know when we're out of sorts. Um, and we get this through a much less understood process of interoception. These, are the, these receptors are distributed throughout the body, la large amounts in the intestinal system, and they inform us about the state of our body. So the old idea that there's five ways that information leaks in is not really going to hold up. So when we come to perception and how we come to know the world around us, there are several different kind of frameworks that we can use. There are several different kinds of questions that we can ask, and they don't all provide the same answers. So we somehow become aware of the world around us, and we also cope with the world. These are not really distinguished. We often sometimes lapse into talk of perception as if we were in a movie theater inside our heads, just watching the world. But in fact, we are always engaged in the world and the various sensory modalities are crucially involved in regulating and making possible that engagement. A possible term that might be useful here is sense-making. If we assume that we need a new term here, which accommodates our um, everyday understanding of the world is presented to us from which we pick up information, but recognize that we also need to accommodate the, um, the manner in which we are integrated into a flow of our activities, coping with surfaces, things in the world all the time. So sense-making is a nice superordinate term that can accommodate multiple ways to come at the many questions of perception. So there are different theoretical assumptions available, and they'll lead to different kinds of insights. So there will not be one story to be told here about perception. I'm going to choose to divide the approaches to perception into two camps, which come with different questions, provide different forms of explanation, 
and have different underlying metaphysical presumptions. So these cannot necessarily be unified. In short, the manner in which we come to understand perception will depend on the questions we ask at the outset. The first group of theories are internalist theories. These are probably best aligned with our everyday talk about perception, in which we speak of something called the external world. Can I just remind you for a minute that there's only one world, there's not an internal and an external world? That doesn't make sense. It's a legacy of the Cartesian split, the cogito. But we need to talk about it. Sometimes this distinction is useful in which we separate the experiencing subject from the world. The world here is cast as inert, passive. And this is a strongly cognitivist um, way of approaching theories of perception that emphasize the singular notion of an unfolding theater of experience in the individual. The computational theory of mind will adopt a purely internalist approach to perception. And perhaps some questions can be answered like that and others cannot. A largely separate group of theories, and um, less well known, are relational theories in which we consider the embedding of an active subject in the world and look not at what's going on in the head, as it were, but look at what's going on between the subject and the world. This contrast is going to be of a kind with a contrast that recurs throughout this module. Internalist theories tend to be neurocentric, individualist, and um, constructed on the basis of something like a Cartesian metaphysics. Relational theories tend to uh, emphasize the entire body, so be far less neurocentric um, and less capable of giving an account of individual experience of any sort. So you pay your money, you take your chances. On internalist approaches, we get this kind of picture in which a cat is seen because light bounces off the cat, which causes some kind of neural activity, which correlates with conscious awareness of the cat. And so this is strongly, strongly neurocentric. It's all concerned with what's going on in the brain. And to this extent, these theories are quite compatible with our everyday way of talking about ourselves. They have come to occupy a very important place in our folk epistemology. But we can make ourselves aware of the perplexity that we introduce when we take this notion of being inside a head too seriously. There's a wonderful film called Being John Malkovich, and if you haven't seen it, I strongly recommend it. Um, that sort of takes the everyday language of being inside our heads to ridiculous extremes. I'm going to show you the trailer for this movie now, but I do recommend that you watch the movie. And the underlying conceit could hardly be more absurd. There is, in this movie, a portal, a door, entered from an office. And when you go through the portal, you slide down a chute and you end up inside the actor John Malkovich's head, peering out through his eyes. Does anyone peer out through your eyes? Do you peer out through your eyes? Well, it becomes very strange, the idea that we might occupy a position inside the head, peering out through the head. And interestingly, the movie then goes into the quite deep question of, if we adopt this view, who controls the body? So let's just watch the trailer for this. There's a tiny door in my office, Maxine, and it takes you inside John Malkovich. There's no such thing as a hole in somebody's brain. Yes, there is. You see the world through John Malkovich's eyes? Mm -hmm. And then after about 15 minutes... And that's not me! I didn't say that! You're spit out loud into a ditch on the side of the New Jersey turnpike. It was amazing. Do you think that it's kind of weird that John Malkovich has a portal? I mean, do you think that it might have some sort of significance? What is going on? Huh? I discovered that portal. It's my head! John Cusack, Cameron Diaz, Catherine Keener, and John Malkovich. Malkovich! Malkovich! 
John Malkovich. Now, that is obviously an absurd movie and wonderfully entertaining. And it draws liberally from um, this concepts with which we try to make sense of ourselves and uses them in an entirely creative and undisciplined fashion. So they say we're in his subconscious. That doesn't actually mean anything. Um, but it ties well with a tendency we have, which is to associate ourselves with our brains. This is a deeply problematic assumption that is very, very widespread. So internalist approaches to perception often adopt a spectatorial view of the world, this idea of looking out at the world instead of being in the world. And we want to contrast those with embodied relational approaches that emphasize activity in the world. And the basic move here is to ask not what's in your head, but what your head is inside of, that is to pay attention to the relations that obtain between the embodied subject and the immediate surrounds. Relational approaches tend to be most concerned with the activity of the body in its environment. We'll meet this later in the work of James J. Gibson. But for now, we're just going to prime our intuitions by looking at what I think is the simplest visual system that one can imagine or that we know of. And the visual system we want to talk about belongs to this little guy. Tripodalia cystophora will grow up to be a box jellyfish. Kind of a problematic animal, delivers a nasty sting, sometimes found in Irish waters. But in its larval stage, before it metamorphizes into its final adult form, it's a very simple creature with only five cell types and no nervous system whatsoever, and no eyes, and no brain, okay? There's only five distinguished cell types, and on the outside of the box jellyfish larva, we find two kinds of cells. So the box jellyfish larva is shown at the top, and as you can see, most of the cells on its outside have little hairs on them called cilia. And these hairs wiggle, and thus they provide a form of motion. But the motion is largely undirected. But in between those cells, every now and then, there is a cell which is of a different sort. These are the ocelli, or ocelli. I confess I don't know how to pronounce that word. One of those is shown lar enlarged at the bottom of the slide in panel B. And here you can see there's also a cilia, there's also a hair sticking out, but this is enmeshed in some um, hairs which are attached to photosensitive vesicles so that the gradient of the incoming light sets these hairs in one angle rather than another. That is, for those hairs that belong to the ocelli, they will adopt a fixed angle with respect to the gradient, the slope, of the incoming light. Now think about that. What do you get if you have a gooseberry, a hairy gooseberry, randomly moving, and now some hairs adopt a fixed angle with respect to the gradient of the incoming light? If you have any experience with boats, you will recognize that what this is, is a distributed rudder. Those hairs that adopt a fixed angle will steer this in one direction rather than another, and that turns out to be useful. Box jellyfish needs to steer towards the light, quite simply, because that's where the food is going to be. They live in the top few feet of the water, and up or towards the light is where the processes of photosynthesis are generating nutrition in the form of algae. So we get a distributed rudder system. I call this a visual system, because we're making use of the properties of the ambient light to serve the purposes of the organism. But this is not how we usually think about perception. We often think about perception as if it were input. There is no input-output relationship here. This is both perception and a means of controlling action. So it's a perception-action system. And there's no obvious boundary between an inside and an outside. There's no interiority that we need to appeal to. So that, for me, is the simplest visual system we can um, identify. Now, as we go on, we'll see that most work in about perception has been done in a visual modality. Uh, that creates its own problems. It's useful to begin, then, by thinking of vision not as a means of 
image transmission or anything like that, but as a means of influencing one's relation and coping with the demands of living in a specific kind of world.